Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 84 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a terrific discussion this week with Melissa D. Arabian for this episode. And more on that in a minute, I wanted to give you first a uh, an update here about what else is coming up on the show. Lots of... Um, really terrific guests in the coming weeks. So next week on the show will be Dr. BJ Miller. And BJ is a hospice and palliative care physician. Uh, very interesting, very insightful guy. Um, one of the questions I asked him is, what does he think that people who are dying have to teach those of us who are still alive? So you'll want to be sure to catch his discussion and his terrific TED Talk as well. Um, after that, in the coming weeks after that, uh, my interview with Karen Phelps Moyer, who is the uh, co-founder of Aluna Network, and now has is doing a number of things, including a dating support uh, coaching service for widowed people and other people who are reimagining love at midlife. So we dive into the topic of dating for... I think the first time on the show, and that'll be in a few weeks. Um, what else? Oh, uh, coming up in November, be on the lookout for Children's Grief Awareness Month. I'm going to start doing uh, daily live stream discussions with uh, Grief Center so we can bring some more resources to you in uh, your community wherever you are. So if you are listening and you uh, run a grief center, shoot me a note, and uh, if you know of one, um, let me know or reach out to them and ask them to reach out to me. Love to include as many resources as possible. So, um, oh, one more thing, uh, an update on my memoir, which is going to be released in January. I'm very excited about that. It's called Future Widow, Losing My Husband, Saving My Family, and Finding My Voice. And it should be available for pre-order very soon. So be on the lookout for that. If you're listening and you're not on my email list, do be sure to get on and then uh, make sure you don't miss any of the episodes with BJ and Karen and uh, news about the book. So uh, you can join my uh, email list at my website, JennyLisk.com. All right. Hey, let's uh, let's get on with today's show. The Widowed Parent Podcast is supported by Audible, and I'm excited to say that listeners can get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. Just go to audibletrial.com slash widowedparent. That's audibletrial.com slash widowedparent, and you get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of Audible. I hope you'll check it out. I had such a great discussion with Melissa D. Arabian for this episode. So today we round out Suicide Prevention Month by talking about Melissa's reflections and perspectives as someone who lost her mom to suicide when she was in college. And Melissa actually uh, does quite a lot of work with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and uses her platform as a uh, uh, Food Network star uh, to bring attention and support to to the cause. Uh, I first remember hearing about Melissa, or, or watching her actually, when she was on the next Food Network star, and she was the winner of season five of that, and then uh, after that hosted her own show, $10 Dinners, and has been on a bunch of their other shows as well. Um, so I thought it would be really um, important and and interesting to round out this suicide prevention month last week we had joanne harpel on talking from a you know the an expert perspective perfect with her work uh, professional work um in terms of survivors of suicide loss working with them um and doing lots of speaking and training on the topic uh to round out this week with melissa's story and her you know sharing her experience losing her mom to suicide when when she was in college um and since she was here, we also talked a bit about food. I, I do think that that topic is is also relevant to those of us who are widowed parents. Um, you know, the the struggle as a busy parent, uh, whether you're widowed or not, but the struggle to put food on the table every night. And you know, as a widowed parent, as as the only parent, um, that now falls entirely to you know to that person. And if you're anything like me, um, my, my husband was the much more enthusiastic cook in the family and he actually liked to, to do that. Um, and so this is not a role that I naturally am excited about. <laughs> um, 
So I wanted to talk to Melissa a little bit about that as well. She's got a couple of terrific cookbooks, um, which are really accessible. And uh, I think I might start experimenting with, with one of those. And we, we talk about that a little bit in, uh, later in the show, too. So um, I hope you enjoy my discussion with Melissa D. Arabian. My guest today is Melissa D'Arabian. Melissa is a celebrity chef, television host, best-selling author, speaker, writer, and mom of four. After winning season five of The Next Food Network star, Melissa premiered her inaugural cooking show, $10 Dinners, proving that a delicious budget-friendly meal can be made without compromise. She followed the show with her first cookbook, also called $10 Dinners, and her next cookbook, Supermarket Healthy. Melissa lends her voice to causes close to her heart, such as Childhood Hunger with Share Our Strengths No Kid Hungry campaign and Suicide Awareness with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And it's because of her work on the latter that I've invited her to speak with me today as part of Suicide Prevention Month. Melissa is joining us today from San Diego, California. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jenny. Yeah, this is going to be great. I've really been looking forward to talking with you. And so, you know, last week on the show, as part of Suicide Prevention Month, uh, we had Joanne Harpel, who is an international authority on suicide bereavement and postvention response. Uh, and I thought it would be really nice to round out the month talking with you about your perspective as someone who lost a parent to suicide at a, at a young age. Um, so let's just jump right in here. Um, I'd like to ask you about your mom first. You've said that she was an extraordinary woman and that her, her death does not define her. So can you tell us about her? What was she like and what was her life like? Um, you know, Jenny, thanks so much for asking about my mom. Um, because I think that um, when, when my experience of someone dying by suicide, that can kind of take over the conversation about, about who she was. And... Um, so I do deeply believe that how her life ended does not define um, her life. And it's not even the most important part about her life. Um, so my mom was, um, was really smart and she was really funny. I think those were kind of the, um, the two things that I remember uh, most about my mom was how smart she was and how funny she was. And she was also very uh, spontaneous, um, which is, it's kind of funny to say this. I was just about to say, you know, just somebody who really loved life, which doesn't fit into the, the profile of who you might think about as being at risk for suicide. Um, so, yeah, so my mom was, um, uh, you know, this, this is a perfect description of, of my mom that, you know, back in the old days, you know, before internet or before even movie phone, the only way you could find out what movies were playing at the theater um, was by, by looking in the newspaper. Like that's, mm -hmm. how, that's how you looked, that's how you found it. Oh, get the paper. And you would look it up to see where you could go. And so my mom, as a matter of practice, always uh, got the, I think it was on Thursdays is when the movies get released. She always took the Thursday newspaper and put it in the car um, because you just never know when you might want to go see a movie. Um, <laughs> so she just wanted to have it with her at all times, uh -huh. you know, that we could be out like grocery shopping or, you know, whatever. And, and she wanted to have that freedom to her. That was freedom to be able to look at the, the movie theater, the movie listings and be able to go to the movies at any given time and know exactly what time and where we could go. We were nimble enough that we didn't have to go home or go buy a newspaper somewhere um, because she wanted to embrace that. So I think that, uh, that, that was my mom right there. The lady who always thought to have a newspaper, the Thursday newspaper in her car at all times so that she could respond to the whim of watching the movie. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I wonder what she would think now that we can just pull a little device out of our pocket and oh, check goodness. any of that information anytime we, we want. Uh, there is so much about um, life that would blow my mom away right now. <laughs> so she's been gone for ah, 30 years, um, wow. coming up on 30, no, just past 31 years. Um, so yeah, that's, life has changed a lot in, in 30 years. So there's, yes. there's a lot about today that I sometimes think, oh my goodness, what would my mom say? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sometimes I even think that about my husband who's only been gone for five years, right? How, how the world has changed in the last five years. Yeah, and how the world has changed and also how we have changed, mm -hmm. right? And I think, um, you know, like for me, I think about like the fact that I've got all these kids and, you know, so, um, yeah, the world changes a lot in, in, um, in 30 years, but we change a lot in, you know, six months or 12 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so speaking of then back, turning the clock back still, can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, growing up, the environment around food and cooking that you grew up in and what you learned from your mom about, about food and cooking? Well, I, 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 it's, it's not the story that one might expect or hope from someone who's on Food Network. You know, the, um, the story I'd love to say is that um, my mom was a fantastic cook and we spent hours in the kitchen together. And, um, and so every time I cook, I'm reminded of my... Um, the glory days, the beautiful days of connecting with my mom in the kitchen. And that just was not my story. My mom was um, really a very mediocre cook. Um, but I will tell you this, um, we, can, we can impart the, the joy of cooking, um, even if we ourselves are not great cooks, because I know for a fact that I learned to love cooking from a woman who could not really do it herself. So mm. my mom was not a great cook, um, but... Um, she was a great host. She hmm. understood that the most important part about hosting was not the food. Um, it was the people. And so I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. We, we hosted people all the time um, with really mediocre food and food that wasn't particularly special or even well prepared. Um, you know, we'd have sugar cookies and invite people over. Um, and we'd have... You know, we, we, we invited people into our home all the time and served them pretty mediocre food. Um, and I think that's maybe the beauty of it. I think maybe that even gave me that permission to kind of um, not really worry if the food is all that good because that just didn't seem to be all that important to my mom. <laughs> never, <laughs> never occurred to her that she was a crummy cook. Um, <laughs> she, just, she just kept doing it anyway. Yeah, and was able to host people and bring that that joy and experience into your mm -hmm. home. In yeah, spite of that. yeah, that's yeah, yes. So I did. I got I got my love of cooking um, from my mom, um, but I didn't get my cooking skills from my mom. That <laughs> that, that came from somewhere else. I don't know yeah. where, but it came from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, but I'd say love of cooking is maybe the harder thing to get, right? Because skills you can always acquire, right? But those kind of attitudes and stuff that's important. You know, I, for me, it is, um, you know, people cook for different reasons. Um, and when we think about like the chef world, um, there's, you know, the cooking in the chef world is, um, is different from cooking for your family on a Tuesday night or, mm. or for cooking for your neighbors or whatever. So for me, um, the people are more important than the plate. Um, and I think for, um, you know, 99% of the cooking that we do in this world is of the Tuesday night, 6 p.m. variety. And, and for that, um, we, we don't really need to know how to make fancy swooshes on a plate and, um, and have, you know, these kind of chefy artsy skills, which are beautiful and wonderful. And that's not to minimize them, but I do think that they are, they're, shown on TV in a way that, um, that sometimes make us feel like the Tuesday night 6 p.m. cooking is somehow less, um, mm. less worthy or less important. And I would argue that on a daily basis, on a day in and day out basis, that makes up the bulk of our, of our experience with food. Mm. Yeah. Well, and I want to get back to your mom here in a second, but before I do, I just want to say, I mean, I think that's what was so magical about your your run on the Next Food Network star. I was rooting for you as someone who, you know, is trying to put dinner on the table on a Tuesday night, right? And you had such a different, you know, your, your whole thing was, I'm a busy mom and I'm being realistic and I'm putting good food on the table at a, you know, at a good price. And it was very different, I think, from some of the other contestants approaches so it was, it was really great to see is what I'm trying to say refreshing uh to see your the perspective that you brought to it uh well well thank you um you know and I think that the kind of the bigger takeaway from that you know as if anybody's kind of listening to this and sort of thinking um 
you know, what, what do I bring to the table? And I mean that figuratively, not, not necessarily in the, in the cooking space, but um, sort of leaning into what, what do I know? What do I, um, what do I have that I can share with this world? Um, and sort of leaning into that and celebrating that and not getting distracted by all the gifts of everybody else. Um, mm. So I think that's, that's kind of that bigger life takeaway of, of my experience at Next Food Network Star is that, yes, there were better cooks, for sure. Um, but leaning into what I brought to the table, which is that experience of being that busy mom and, you know, and four kids in diapers and, and being on a budget and all of that. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 the bigger story is not how to win Next Food Network Star. The bigger story is how to lean in and celebrate um, – the lot that we are dealt with and the, and, and what is going on in our lives and how, how do we lean into that and then contribute to the world in that, in that our own unique way? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Um, okay. So let's, let's turn back the clock again here a little further to, um, you know, you were in college um, shortly before your mom died. I think you'd gone home for a visit and you guys went shopping. Can you tell us about that and what that memory means to you now? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was actually the week before she died. I went home and went shopping um, with her. And, um, and now that weekend trip, um, you know, just a college kid home for the weekend with her mom. And we were shopping for um, a sorority formal dress. And, you know, I remember we had lunch at her favorite restaurant. And we, you know, we just did all the things that we, we did. Um, and um, and then, you know, a few days later was when she died. And so, you know, going back, of course, now that remains, you know, that kind of frozen moment in time of sort of like, oh, I had no idea that that was going to be the last time I had lunch with her. Um, you know, we watched a movie. I remember we rented a movie um, and we, um, you know, we bought my um, my my formal dress, we did, you know, did all these things, these sort of really um, simple things that now kind of got crystallized and sort of elevated into, you know, you know, capital L last moments, um, you know, last time of this and that. And so, um, yeah, so that, that, um, that, that remains pretty, uh, remains a pretty powerful memory in my mind. Um, and then I also kind of, you know, I'm human. I kind of go back and kind of relive that and sort of see like, what did I miss? Did I, you know, um, what, what did I miss? Um, you know, so that, that, that haunted me for a decade, you know, yeah. that, um, what, you know, what could I have done? What could uh, I have done? What did I miss? Um, so, yeah, that, that, that weekend um, certainly got elevated in memory status. Um, yeah. 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 And then, so how did you find out then that your mom had died? I called home. I wanted, I was, you know, a few days later, I, I wanted her credit card number. She had told me that, um, that she would um, pay for me. I wanted to go to graduate school, so I needed to take the LSAT and the GMAT. And mm. so... Um, she, uh, that weekend, we talked about, oh, I want to go to law school and business school. I mean, she knew that I wanted to go to law school and business school. So, uh, but we had talked about specifically, oh, it's time for me to start studying for the uh, LSAT and GMAT. So she had said, oh, yeah, well, why don't we pay, why don't we, why don't you go to a prep course for like Stanley Kaplan or Princeton Review, one of those. And so I was calling because she was going to give me her credit card number so that mm -hmm. I could pay for pay for it so I was calling and I kept getting the busy signal busy signal busy signal and then um because this was 1989 and um and then finally after hours of getting the busy signal finally I it went through and then um and that's when the police picked up so yeah I was calling home wow that must have been a <laughs> <laughs> what else does a 20 year old want from her mom right <laughs> the just... formal dress was not enough I want, right. I want I want your credit card number <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been quite a shock. Yes, it was. It was. And, um, you know, from a, um, 
like a physical sense, it's the only time in my life where I think I actually was like in shock. Like I remember mm. it felt very different from anything I've ever felt. Um, it was a very, very, uh, very powerful um, shock. Uh, yes, it was a shock, you know, and, and so there was the shock of that moment, which was, a, you know, really a physical um, I really felt that physically, but then there's also then just kind of the, the aftermath, which was, um, you know, it, it was no longer just a shock. It was literally the, well, not literally, but the, uh, figuratively the, you know, the scaffolding of my life just sort of caving in on itself. So it was no longer like, oh, now there are a lot of holes in the walls and I don't know where to look and how to, um, you know, how to navigate. Like the scaffolding caved in on itself. Mm. And that was, um, it was, it was truly a redefining um, devastation where truly everything in my life um, uh, would now be like a before that and after that. Um, um, set up. So um, having been raised by my mom, you know, as a single mom, um, and so it was really just the two of us throughout high school and uh, my high school and then, um, you know, and then in college, you know, it was, it was, it meant, it meant I no longer had a place to go for Thanksgiving. It meant I had no place to go for Christmas. I meant I had no, it, it meant that like all of that was gone, all of it. Everything, everything that I, you know, and then there's the, the fact that, you know, she had finally become a physician and then killed herself. Then I'm sort of left with the knowledge that everything that she had worked up to getting clearly wasn't enough. So then there's this, you know, it's kind of messing with my sense of purpose and does it really even matter? Um, you know, what, what's sort of the point if I, what's the point of going to law school and business school if you know, if going through medical school didn't result in, you know, life worth living. So there was a lot going on there um, emotionally and mentally, but also just logistically, you know, there's just, um, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's no more home. You know, we, we sold our house. Um, there's no insurance because, Suicide exclusions excluded a lot, excluded most of her insurance, so there's no money for anything. Um, so it was just it was that was that was definitely a life defining uh, phone call for sure. That, yeah. that, that definitely became a before and after right. um, phone call for me. Mm, yeah. Um, what do you wish the people around you had known or done in the months or years after your mom died? Huh. You know, that's a very interesting question that nobody has asked me before. Really? Um, yeah, nobody's asked me that before. Hmm. Um, but I will say the one thing. I remember that I, um, so, well, I'll probably say a couple things, but one thing came straight to mind. I remember um, after, her, after my mom's death, I went and saw a therapist. Now, my mom was a psychiatrist, so I kind of grew up in this space of, you know, therapy. <clears throat> It was kind of part of my upbringing was this, um, you know, sense of that therapy is sort of a, uh, is, is a good thing. And I went and saw a therapist and pretty much said, you know, my mom just killed herself and I don't have any other family. And so I'd kind of, you know, things are not good and I want to, um, you know, explore that. And I remember that the therapist said something, and I'm like, now I'm paraphrasing because it was 30 years ago, but something like, I don't know, you seem like a really smart young woman, like you've got a good head on your shoulders, you know, not everybody's going to have something that they really need to process. And like basically said, you may not need therapy. What? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, which I, I just look back and I want to be like, wait, I would love to track this person down and be like, wait, what? So I was like, oh, okay, maybe I am kind of, maybe I do have this, you know, figured out, whatever, uh, which just looking back at it, I think, my goodness, who would, who would say that to a 20 year old yeah. kid? Did, but did that keep you away from therapy for a while then? Or? It did. It didn't, it didn't make me anti therapy, but it did make me not feel like it was super important. So, um, you know, anyway, so I guess I, I, I wish that somebody had kind of um, 
been there to support me into into that a little bit better. Um, the other, the other piece was it it because my mom wasn't married at the time of her dying. Um, like there was sort of nobody who really was sort of in charge of me, you know, mm. and like I really did lose any sense of, you know, there was, like I said, nobody, nobody, nobody had an empty space at their table if I didn't show up for Thanksgiving, mm. which isn't to say I didn't have lovely people in my life who invited me. For sure they did. I was surrounded by a lot of, a lot of, people who loved me um, and friends and, and, and people who opened up to me. But that is very different from having one person with accountability and, and sort of really checking in and kind mm-hmm. of in a long-term way. And I'll give you an example. Um, like there was, um, a, there was a tiny bit of insurance money, like tiny bit, um, very tiny bit. And I remember when I went off to graduate school, like I, I I didn't know to apply for financial aid. I didn't, like, I just, I didn't know any of that. And I had in my bank account from my mom, like the exact amount of like maybe three quarters, the exact amount, maybe, sorry, those, that doesn't make any sense, but the amount of about three quarters of the tuition for where I was going to graduate school, I was going to Georgetown. So I remember thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm going to, pay for one year and I'm going to work full time to pay for my expenses and I'll save up enough to pay for the second year. Like I'll just have to make it work and I'll kind of deal with year two when I get to it. So I went to Georgetown. I paid them all the money out of my account and then I like worked like crazy. And I, like that's the kind of thing that like oh, all we needed was one reasonable adult to say, um, you don't have any parents you need to apply for financial aid. Yeah. You're probably going to get some grants. You'll probably get some low cost loans. You'll get like, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know. Like I just literally wrote a check for every bit that was in my savings account. So like, that's just like one tiny example of there was nobody, there was nobody who had any, any sense of kind of ownership or guidance over me. So lots of invitations, but no accountability and nobody really there present and parenting me through this. And I think looking back at it, I think, goodness, I think that would have been really helpful to have had somebody parenting in a very connected way instead of just lots of really nice invitations. Um, And that, I think that was probably what was missing in my twenties. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when your mom died, you were 19 or 20. So you I were 20. I was okay. Exactly so 20. you were over 18. You didn't need a guardian. I mean, that was That's like, right. right. Yeah, That's right. But yes, at 20, was, obviously, you weren't like, you know, grown up, grown up. <laughs> That's right. Or even like I was a junior in college. So my senior year, I had to pay uh, my mm-hmm. tuition. But like even that, nobody, yeah. nobody said, hey, listen, we need to talk to your colleges about like, nobody said that. Not one person said, Hey, you know, we need to figure out a financial strategy. We need like, mm-hmm. none of, and you know, you're 20. You've never, I didn't know. I just, you know, I literally was like, I just, I just, I knew I needed to graduate from college. And right. I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. Right, anyway, right. Um, so things like that, I think were, um, um, were probably missing. Now on, on the bright side, on the, the good news is that I did have lots of invitations and I did um, lean into a lot of, um, you know, a lot of love and a lot of people welcoming me in. And, um, and so I do think that there was a lot of good that came out of that sense of, you know, sometimes you just, you, you sort of have no choice but to accept the help and the invitations and the love. Um, and so that, um, that period really taught me about connecting and leaning in and, and what support can look like, um, you know, from peers really mm-hmm. from, um, you know, from people around me and the women around me. I do think that that decade after my mom died was really the decade where I um, fell in love with female friendship and, um, and female friends as being a family to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard you say 
If there's one gift you've, you've taken from your mom's death, it's the ability to be happy with a capital H without being happy. Can you tell us about that? What's the difference between happiness with a capital H and happiness with a small H? Yeah, so happy capital H. Capital H happy is really more like that, um, you know, that deep joy, um, you know, and it's, it comes from being connected um, and feeling like, um, like I'm connected enough. For me, it's connection to God and connection to other people. Um, when I have that deeper joy or capital H happiness, um, it feels big enough to house lives, uh, life sorrows. So that doesn't mean I'm not sad or that I don't have a bad day or that bad things don't happen. Um, but small age happy is um, sort of what is dependent upon what's happening in the outside world. You know, did I get a promotion? Did I get a raise? Did I, you know, did we get the house that we wanted? Did we, um, did I get the parking spot? Did I, you know, whatever, all the, the little age happy stuff, like the, the stuff that happens around us. Mm. Um, capital H happy is, um, is an internal job. And um, to feel like I can be capital H happy uh, or joyful um, and have that sense of that anchor of capital H happy and of deeper joy that can house um, the, the small H happy stuff going south. Mm -hmm. um, I think is is probably the greatest gift that I got from my mom's dad. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for telling us about that, for, for explaining the difference there. Um, thinking about suicide, I've, I've also heard you say that people tend to talk about it in whispers and that you think we need to be having louder conversations about that. Can you tell us, can you talk about that? Yeah. And when I say that people talk about suicide in whispers, I mean literal whispers. Mm. Um, you know, when, when my mom died... People, um, you know, would say, oh, you know, oh, they mentioned that she had died. And then it was, you know, like suicide, uh, you know, it's uh -huh. like literally like it's, it's, um, yeah, I mean, suicide's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. And um, it, so I get that inclination, but um, the, the road to suicide is, um, can be a little bit messy and hard to talk about. Um, and so I, I get that inclination, but I think that we need to have a conversation about suicide. Literally 30 years ago when my mom died, you know, people very nicely offered to say, we don't have to let anybody know that this was suicide. And, uh. and I remember thinking, well, I'm not the one who did it. I don't know why, <laughs> why I should be embarrassed. Uh, uh -huh. I remember thinking like, well, uh, you know, it kind of struck me as odd. It was sort of like, you know, nice, nice people sort of said, we don't have to let anybody know. Um, you know, looking back at it, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the insurance money uh, would have been a much different situation um, had I taken them up on their offer. Um, <laughs> but... Um, but I think that we need, we need to have that conversation about suicide. I do think that it's our secrets that kill us. And, um, and I think a willingness to, um, to talk about suicide um, and to broaden that conversation to talk about mental health and to talk about um, some of the, um, the risk factors for suicide and some of the, um, the warning signs for suicide and how we respond to um, the uh, warning signs to suicide. All of that needs to be a conversation that we have um, openly, and, and that happens when we remove the stigma and when we remove the shame. I do think that we have made a lot of strides in that direction. People now talk uh, much more openly about suicide than they did 30 years ago, and we also talk about mental health. And now we actually have um, laws that make mental health that put mental health in parity with physical health. Um, so we are, we are getting there um, for sure. And when we think about having the, um, you know, the, uh, the three digit hotline, you know, for, uh, for suicide and how that has just passed through, um, uh, through Congress, we, um, we can think about how we are with our policies and with our conversations and with our, um, our school structures, we are starting to make mental health 
a conversation that we can all have um, and that we can step into and recognize that mental health is, um, is important and it's linked to our physical health and um, it's not something that we need to sweep under the rugs and rug and not talk about. And we certainly don't need to say the word suicide in whispers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I know you've been very active with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and um, using your platform to help bring awareness to the cause and support and all that. And I'll put a link to their uh, website in the show notes. I think we're going to run out of time to talk about um, your work with them today because I do want to talk to you about food and cooking for widowed parents. Um, you know, I'm thinking of myself even, but people I talk to, right? People who are trying to solve this problem of what to put on the table every night, right? And it may be that, um, you know, a widowed parent is now a single parent. They're the only adult, you know, doing all the things in the household. It may be that their spouse had been the primary cook and they're feeling lost. Um, I guess what would you say to someone who's struggling to, to answer that question? And can you tell us about some resources you might have in your books also? Um, for putting dinner on the table every night? Yeah, we're talking, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, the, the first thing I would say is, you know, we need to go easy on ourselves, right? We, we don't have to do it perfectly. So let's just start there. That uh, we don't have to do it perfectly. And, um, and there's, there's no, no need for us to bring into that space language of guilt or should or I'm doing it wrong. I'm not doing enough or, um, you know, I, I shouldn't order a pizza because I should be making a homemade meal or whatever. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have to do this perfectly. So I just want to, I just want to say that. Um, and there are also seasons for um, doing, you know, for having high standards for ourselves to not, you know, to go and cook and do everything. You know, there are seasons for that. And then there are also seasons for, you know what, let people bring the food. Um, you know what, let Domino's do the cooking tonight. Like that's like, we, we, we need to, we need to kind of de-villainize um, the idea that we are um, we need to cook all the time um, and and make it perfect. Um, the other thing I would throw out there is that it doesn't need to be complicated. You know, it, it really doesn't. You know, you can go to the store and buy. Um, you know, some of the, the pastas that have like the flaxseed and the, the chickpeas in it. And like literally boil up pasta and put on, you know, a little bit of butter and, you know, and it, like, and it's fine. You know, there's, you can get one of those ready-made salads, like literally pull out a handful of baby spinach and put it onto a plate and put on like a nice, even pre-made store-bought dressing. And you know what? That can still feel really good. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and it doesn't have to be fancy. And it doesn't have to um, be something that you would see on a Food Network show. When we're feeding our families, um, there's, there's more to it than what that food actually is. And I will just throw something out there that, you know, when we take a tiny step, toward um, a goal. And if the goal is fresh food around a table every night, connecting with our kids or whatever, you know, the, the tiny steps can actually give us a lot of traction. So for instance, if you're ordering pizza, you know, great. So order the pizza, but maybe when you're ordering pizza, then you sit down and you just sit at the table. Maybe it is paper <clears throat> plates, but maybe you're still sitting around the table, you know, and maybe that's enough. Maybe, maybe it's just the connection. And it, listen, if you have to choose between connecting with the people you love or eating a homemade meal, I would choose the connection every time. I really uh, would. I yeah. really would. Our bodies are really resilient and we can, we, can, we can get the nutrients from a lot of foods. Now, yeah, does that mean let's eat chicken nuggets every night for you know, a year? No, it doesn't. But you know, do I think that it, need, it means that we, there's a space for that? Yeah, I think there's space for chicken nuggets sitting with your, with your kids during a rough day that you just can't rally to get, get yeah. dinner on the table. I think that's fine. Now, so just for some like tips, I'm like, oh, what are some things that we could keep on hand for those quick meals that, that yeah. do feel a little bit healthy um, and that make us feel good? Because the truth is 
if we're eating a lot of like processed foods, we're actually emotionally going to feel that. So just in the spirit of like, just not feeling crummy, um, not because it's quote unquote the right thing to do, but because you're going to actually feel better. Um, one thing I, I think is a great fast food to have on hand and you can have them frozen or you can have them in the fridge would be blueberries. Those mm. are, um, those are really great for um, bringing in, you know, some nutrients, but also some mood support. I also love frozen salmon that you can like get like frozen uh, salmon fillets that are all prepped and ready to go that you can just like stick in the oven with a little salt and pepper and lemon on it, like whatever, or, you know, put a bunch of soy sauce on it and stick it in the oven with some lemon and garlic salt. You know, they're, they're having some, fatty fish really helps in terms of it's really fast um, and you can get it for the freezer. You can even get canned salmon and make salmon cakes. Um, so there's some really fast um, mood support foods that, um, that I lean on during um, tough times. Um, so I do try to make sure that I'm having salmon or some sort of fatty fish once or twice a week when I'm in kind of a, a space where I need to be taking care of myself, um, but I also don't, need to, don't want to be bothered. Um, I mentioned like some of those pastas that are kind of higher protein pastas. Those are great. Um, and then also smoothies. Smoothies are great um, a great like breakfast or lunch item that you can load up with a lot of great, I, I, I lean on really good high quality fats and omega-3s when I'm feeling I need some mood support. So like flaxseed, uh, chia seed, avocado, um, those are some great um, items to put into smoothies, nut butters that add some fat, add some fiber, and add um, add some nutrients that are really mood supporting. So if I can have something like that, some sort of high quality fat or omega three item in my in my day, those are some of my easy go to ways of getting those foods into my system when I'm like I know that I need some support. Um, mood support and and just being kind and gentle, my, gentle to myself, but I just don't have it in me to uh, make up a big meal. So there's nothing stopping me from having that, like a loaded smoothie, um, you know, with hemp seed and chia and and flax, you know, for uh, for lunch and then dinner. Like, okay, we're just having pasta and, and <laughs> we're having noodle night and salad. And like, yeah. that's fine. That's yeah. just fine. I love it. I love it. Well, and so if I'm going to start cooking here should i start with ten dollar dinners or supermarket healthy so those are the the uh, my two cookbooks um yeah you know supermarket healthy i think um is is really the one where um you know both of those books are really talking about eating mindfully and spending mindfully um supermarket healthy kind of leads with the health and then everything is sort of uh, reasonably priced. Um, Ten dollar dinners leads with the price, but it's also food that's meant to make you feel good. If I'm optimizing for feeling good, um, I would go with supermarket healthy mm -hmm. um, because that's uh, nothing in there's expensive. It's all supermarket available, um, but it really leads with foods that make you feel good and support. Um, your well-being and it's all well it's all easy it's all stuff that you can make on a Tuesday night so yeah. I would say supermarket healthy okay good well thank you um because I, I have both on my shelf and rather than going eeny meeny miny mo, I thought I would just ask you so thank you uh we are almost out of time I just want to ask one wrap-up question if you don't mind here um if you could say one thing to survivors of suicide loss what would you say to them I would say you're not alone you're not alone. Um, I remember the first time I went to um, an out of the darkness walk um, through AFSP and it was such an extraordinary experience to be surrounded by people who understood, who could have the conversations, who could share stories. I thought it would be, I was a little nervous to go because I kind of thought, I don't know that I really want to be depressed today. And and what I was amazed to find out was how much joy I get from connecting with other people 
who were connected through this really tragic thing. And yet there's so much that fills my soul about us coming together um, to support people going through that now and the people who will wake up tomorrow in that vortex of despair. So I guess I would say don't hesitate to reach out and connect into the AFSP, if we're thinking about suicide loss or whatever that loss group could be, because I was, I was nervous to do it because I thought I don't, I worked kind of so hard to kind of, kind of be okay after losing my mom. I thought it's going to depress me to go back in and live in this world of, of suicide prevention. And yet, what I didn't realize, um, and I've now realized over the past 12 years that I've been um, involved with AFSP, is how, how much healing has come from and joy has come from being part of that movement. Um, so I would say um, don't, don't, don't push away from it, but lean into it. And we probably lean into it in different ways, you know, when, when, when the the loss is fresh, you're leaning into it maybe more for support. Um, and then as years go by, you might be finding that you're leaning into it, into supporting others. And, um, and what joy that brings. I, I, never, I never imagined that I could get such joy out of something that, um, that brought such sorrow and still does. It's still a loss. But I, I sit there sometimes in, in AFSP meetings because now I'm on the board and now I'm you know, really involved. In it. And I sometimes sit there and think, like, I'm here in New York for this board meeting um, because I lost my mom. Like, I, it, like to, to reconcile that, to find such joy and purpose, um, you know, in something that brought such sorrow is um, is probably as good as it can get um, without getting my mom back. Um, it's as good as it can get. It's as good of a plan B um, that is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think, I think that's a great place to end. Uh, so my guest today is Melissa D. Arabian, winner of season five of the Next Food Network Star and an advocate for suicide awareness. So Melissa, where can listeners find you and find your books if they'd like to learn more? Yeah, they can find me. I'm on, on all the socials under Melissa D. Arabian. Um, so I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter less, but I'm on Instagram and Facebook a lot. But I am also on Twitter. Um, and information about the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is at AFSP.org. Um, and my books are, you can find the links on my website, which is MelissaDarabian.net, um, or just also on my socials. Um, and any of those. I love, I love connecting with people on my socials. So yes, please do reach out. All right. Fantastic. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thanks, Jenny. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Melissa D. Arabian as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 84. And uh, today, a shout out to all my listeners in California. I just, I realized I was looking at the guests that I've interviewed recently and the guests that will be coming up in the next few weeks. And just completely randomly, there seems to be a whole bunch of people in a row that are all in California. Uh, we, you know, some in Northern California, some in Southern California. But anyway, wonderful to have them. Do be on the lookout for my discussions with Dr. B.J. Miller and Karen Phelps Moyer in the coming weeks. And uh, make sure you're on my email list so you can get notified when, when those are ready. All right. Hey, all for now. Thank you, as always, for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.